This is Film Festival Hacks, the podcast with Film Fest insights from both sides of the badge. Alex Ferrari is the creator of IndieFilmHustle.com and a veteran filmmaker with more than 600 festival credits. Chris Holland from FilmFestivalSecrets.com has worked behind the scenes with more than 200 festivals and is the author of the filmmaking handbook, Film Festival Secrets. Together, they're pulling back the curtain on the film festival knowledge you need to succeed. Welcome back, guys, to another episode of Film Festival Hacks with your host, Alex Ferrari. And I am Chris Holland. So this episode, guys, we're going to talk about formats, uh, screening formats um, and submission formats to film festivals. So the big um, – a lot of people are really confused about what you actually need for film festivals depending on the film festival. So uh, since I've been in post-production for about 20 years now and I've done a just ridiculous amount of deliverables for – features for festivals because I live mostly in the indie world. Uh, I'll kind of go over the, the top the top few that are, are still needed in today's world. Um, first and foremost, on the lowest end, festivals still screen on – and they're rare, but they do still screen. Smaller festivals will still screen on DVD and on Blu-ray, specifically Blu-ray. Blu-ray has really come up because of the cost for the festival to project the blu-ray and the cost for the filmmaker to create the blu-ray so it's and it's a very high quality image a lot of film festivals are screening preferred preferably screening on blu-ray because of the cost factor for 50 bucks or 75 bucks they go get a player hook it up to a projector and off they go so um, keep those in mind. Uh, Blu-rays and DVDs are still very, very feasible today. Uh, another one on the higher end, uh, HD cams. Um, HD cam tapes are very large broadcast quality tapes that um, allow you to have your uh, 1080p master on. Um, I don't think they're at 2K yet, um, but right now they're still mastering at 1080p. And there you could have a stereo mix or you could have a Dolby E down converted 5.1 mix to the two channels on HD cam. And it, I'll explain it to you really quickly, not to get too crazy and technical, but uh, Dolby, uh, Dolby allows a process where you can take your 5.1 mix. If you don't know what a 5.1 mix in your movie is, you, Please Google it. Um, but a 5-1 mix of your movie for a theatrical play uh, will com- will compress it down to two channels instead of five channels or six channels. Um, it will compress it down to two. And then on the other end, wherever they're projecting, they would need Dolby equipment to decode it and pop it out. It's a wonderful scam that Dolby has going. Um, but <laughs> – it's a wonderful scam they got going. You have to rent their gear or buy their gear to encode it and then to decode it on the other end. Uh, but it is very, very powerful because it's it's cheaper to rent that thing than to maybe master at a higher uh, higher level or to a to a HDSR or something like that. So um, a lot of festivals still use uh, HD cams. Film um, Sundance for a, uh, for a while, not anymore, but for a while was HD cam exclusive. Um, if any festival, by the way, any festival asks for a beta SP or a digi beta, run away. <laughs> yeah, I, I can't think of any festivals that are doing that still. Yeah, I mean, if they're busting out digi betas or beta SP tapes, you you really shouldn't be at that festival. I mean, because it, it's not that much more, exp- not much. It's actually cheaper. It's actually cheaper to to project it on a Blu-ray. Um, and then the granddaddy of all formats that you need to uh, or deliverables that you need to provide is a DCP, a digital cinema package. Digital cinema package is just a fancy word for your digital film print. Uh, this is the industry standard. This is what it's kind of like having a 35 millimeter print of your movie in the in a digital form. It is the standard if you're going to play at any theatrical uh, projection anywhere in the United States as a general statement they're going to be using DCPs the, the studios use DCPs uh, independent filmmakers use DCPs uh, they used to cost a lot of money to make before I mean I remember we were charging anywhere between five to nine thousand dollars to do a DCP where now you can get it done for probably anywhere between 750 and 1250 uh, so it's come down dramatically uh, so basically you give them a quick time of your movie uh, with your audio uh, embedded of course they will convert that into a uh, to DCP files and put it back on a hard drive there's two kinds of hard drives you can do it kind of like 
on a standard hard drive where you they could just download it into their system, uh, their, and the, the projectionist could download it into their system, or you can get higher end stuff like the studios use where there's individual keys, tracking, uh, heavy barcoding, and all that kind of stuff just purely because of um, uh, piracy and things like that. But Sundance uses DCPs exclusively, if I'm not mistaken, right, Chris? Yeah, I think they are all DCP even for shorts these days. Right, exactly, because it's it's so affordable to do now, uh, and the quality is great. And it's pretty rock solid once everything uh, plays out. So, DCPs are the the big boys now. As far as submission formats are concerned, um, there are some that still take DVDs as submission formats. I know they are. There, I still I, I just did a few the other day. Uh, so a lot of film, festivals still accept DVDs. But the majority, I would say, are now taking digital submissions, whether that be uploading it to Vimeo uh, and putting a password protect on it and sending that to the festival or using a proprietary upload software like through Without a Box or free, uh, Film Freeway, which will allow you to upload your movie, uh, encode it there securely. And then anytime you submit to a festival and get accepted uh, or, or, or to get reviewed, the festival will just log into to your account and just watch the movie right off their laptop which is not the greatest thing in the world personally i don't i rather have them watch it on a big screen but you never have control about how festivals watch your stuff anyway so chris do you have any perspective on the other side of the film festival curtain well you know i'm always interested to hear about festivals that still will accept screeners on dvd you know like the the pre-judging screeners that just seems like craziness to me but so nine so 1997 uh, you know uh, more power to him i guess um but you know I, in order for you to have the least trouble i think uh it's important to be able to as the person who's submitting to film festivals and dealing with that have some control over what you can output your film as if it's all locked up in your editor's hard drive or, you know, somebody else who you're dependent on to get you that, you know, specialized digital quick time file that the festival is asking for, you're really going to be, you know, uh, hurting <laughs> because mm -hmm. the festivals want what they want. And sometimes if they, don't get it. I mean, they know their projection equipment, right? They know what kind of file. We hope. <laughs> well, for the most part, they do. Let's just give them the benefit of the doubt there. Mm -hmm. But let's put it this way. If a festival doesn't feel like their projection equipment is going to be able to play your giant 18 gigabyte ProRes file, they're going to down, down convert it if they have to, you know? And then they're the ones who are in control of that process, not you. So have some... Uh, some control over that process by have, having some control over your assets. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And, and uh, doing QuickTime compression, I mean, you can't you can't send them a, a Apple ProRes 422HQ monster file, which on a feature film, that's approximately, depending on how complex the images are, anywhere between 80 gigs and I've seen them up to even 200 gigs, depending on the time and, and, the, and the kind of files they originally came from. Uh, but you can compress that down to anywhere between 15 to 20 gigs for a, a feature um, at a very high resolution good looking file that you control the compression on i still use uh old school compressor on uh, on the mac it works wonderfully you have complete control over the bit rate uh but a lot of the a lot of newer um uh editing programs uh allow you to do compression even final cut x um as well as obviously the old final cut uh premiere i think as well has it and a few other uh, online systems have ways for you to compress out that way I just like using compressor because it's it's what I'm familiar with and it works wonderfully and I have a lot of my presets done so I just drop it drag and drop so um, anything else you'd like to add Chris no I think we covered that one pretty well so what are we uh, going to be talking about next week next week we are going to talk about whether film festivals are still even a thing whether they're still relevant a question that we all must ask ourselves at one point or another. No, I'm joking. Uh, we will uh, we'll talk to you guys uh, on the next one, guys. See you later. That's it for another episode of Film Festival Hacks. To learn more about guiding your film to success on the festival circuit, visit filmfestivalhacks.com. <laughs>